Hi, I'm Sarah Weiner, president of the JCC, our beloved JCC, and good evening and welcome to all. This is the 28th year of the JCCNS presenting a diverse, diverse array of new and established authors to our great community. This year's speaker series has something for everyone. Please check out the jccns.org website and help spread the word for our remaining book events in October and November. This, I already said that. Thank you to all our sponsors, cultural benefactors, Howard and Sharon Rich, and to this year's cheers, Patty McWeeny and Sylvia Becker, uh, Belkin. Thanks to the JBM committee and the JCC staff, including Sarah Ewing, Stephanie Greenfield, and many others. Please support all of our authors and buy their books. Copper, book doc, Copper Dog Books, that's a tongue twister, a local bookseller in Beverly, Mass, is here with us tonight. And we have a gorgeous bracelet that was generously donated by our friends at E.B. Horn, Michael Finn. Please consider purchasing raffle tickets online for the chance to own this bracelet, valued at $700. And now it's my pleasure to call up Patty McWeeny to tell you about our author. Don't worry, this is only going to go on for about 20 minutes. So. <laughs> exactly, yeah, you should have had a chair. Thank you, Sarah. And thank all of you for coming tonight. It's so nice to see people in person. So remember, you're in person. You're not on Zoom. That means you're not on mute. So make sure your phones are off, OK? Thank you. Now, we have a great treat in store for you. Our guest speaker, who apparently we won't even let sit down, um, has produced some of the most memorable, important, and groundbreaking stories for a TV show called 60 Minutes. Maybe you've heard of it? <laughs> His book, Ticking Clock, Behind the Scenes at 60 Minutes, tells a riveting story about the inner workings of the TV show we all know so well. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe we don't know the show so well, as he tells us what went on behind the scenes. Who did what, when they did it, with whom, how they did it, there's a lot of good stuff there. And you don't know it from watching the show. Ira Rosen has been a producer for both 60 Minutes and Primetime Live at ABC, both obviously major shows. He started at 60 Minutes in 1980 and took off soon thereafter. He pioneered the use of hidden cameras for primetime live investigations that expose such things as discrimination, abuses at VA hospitals, and political corruption in Washington. Many of his 60 Minutes stories made news, including the Nazi connection, the secret files on how the US smuggled Nazi war criminals into the country for intelligence purposes, and the story of FBI agent Richard Marshall, who was seduced by a Russian KGB agent. He also did the only interview with mafia boss Joe Bonanno, which led to the indictment of the heads of the five mafia families. He's also done many important documentaries. He's a frequent speaker on topics ranging from current events to investigative reporting. He's also co-authored The Warning, a book about Three Mile Island, about the accident at Three Mile Island. And if that's not impressive enough, really we should give him a chair, but he has won an unbelievable number of awards. Unbelievable. From every major award in broadcast journalism, including 24 national Emmys. Who else in here has 24 national Emmys? Looks like just you. He also has four DuPont Awards, two Peabody Awards, and six Investigative Reporters and Editors Awards. In other words, he's big time. 
Mr. Rosen, you're on. Before I begin, let me tell you something about awards. So in my living room, those 24 Emmys are displayed in a bookcase, and we had an electrician come to, to our house, and he walks into the library, and he sees the awards, and he says, oh my god. And my wife says, yeah, I know he's in TV. He says, no, look, he won a golf tournament? <laughs> so, so much for TV awards. You know, in the real world, they don't matter much. Um, so, you know, my life as a 60 Minutes producer in many ways began with the knowledge that my father had given me. And my father was a Holocaust survivor, and he, he had um, lived in a little town called Gonzuka, which was on the border of Poland and Russia. And, uh, and, and we just had a, a, um, a, a ceremony uh, honoring the town. So I, I feel like I feel like I need to talk a little bit about what happened um, on that day in August in 1940. Um, and what happened was the Germans came in and they said to the, to the people in the town, the non-Jews, you have 48 hours to do anything you want to the Jews. And so they could, they could do any crime they wanted. They could murder them, they could rob them, and there was no consequence to any evil that they did. But there were also righteous Gentiles who chose to save the lives of some of the people in the town, including my father. My father was hid in a little uh, haystack for the entire war. He was 15 at the time. And this Catholic family took him in, and they were risking their family to hide him, because if he was found, they would have been killed as well. And I, I think about it every day, the morality of this. Given the choice to save a, a child who you really don't know, will you risk your family to do that? And likewise, given the chance to revenge or commit a crime, knowing that you, you will never suffer any punishment. In fact, people may applaud you. Would you do that? And that was the moral play that had played out in my father's little town. And he had told me the story a lot, and when I, when I got to 60 Minutes um, in 1980, I realized that the secret of 60 Minutes at that time was playing out these moral dilemmas, certainly not on the consequence of a Holocaust, but on much, much smaller level. And one of the examples for, I remember in those when, we, when I got there, they would have a story on, say, group homes. And everybody, oh, group homes, they should be in, in, in our, they should be mainstream, they should be in neighborhoods, but not in my neighborhood. And so you had this story that played out. You see these group homes and people who are supposedly liberal or, or uh, sympathetic to them said, you know, they should be, be placed in neighborhoods, but not in my neighborhood. And then there was a story which I, I still laugh at every time I think about it, which was a story that Harry Reasoner had done called Driving While Old. And what it was, was in Florida, there are certain people who shouldn't be on the road. However, if you take their license away, you ruin their lives. They can't see their friends, they can't go to the supermarket. And, and what do you do if you are the judge? So Harry did this story where you see the judge listening to the people and saying, listen, why don't you just drive within a mile of your house and only drive and try to always have somebody there. And he probably should have taken their license away, but he also knew that if he took their license away, he would ruin their lives, maybe destroy their lives. And so once again, it was the moral dilemmas playing out. What would you do? Don Hewitt, who created 60 Minutes, used to describe these types of stories as the Hey Mildred. And what, he, what that means is he would say, Hey Mildred, come over here. What would you, come here. You gotta see the story. And then the two couch potatoes would sit and argue over, take their license away. No, no, let him drive as long as he's not driving near me. And so you, you have this kind of dilemma. And what 60 Minutes' secret was, was to give you the choice to decide your own set of facts. That's changed. It's all gone. Now, people tune in to have their set of beliefs reinforced. If you're 
a Democrat or you're a liberal, you know what channel to go to. And likewise, if you're a Republican and conservative, you know where to turn to. And the secret of 60 in those early days was really having an objective view, letting the viewers decide and come to their own mind, maybe even change their mind, God forbid. And today, there, there is a dilution of news. And there's, there's podcasting and all sorts of things. But in its heyday, 60 Minutes had an audience that rivaled that of the Super Bowl. And so that, for some reason, is gone from, from what we have seen. And the, the high moral dilemma that played out in Poland and, uh, and, and played out later on in stories that 60 Minutes did by providing people with the, the moral dilemma, what would you do? What view do you have? No longer exists. That's gone. And no matter how much lip service See, the new guy at CNN comes in and says, we're going to be more objective and all this stuff. It's not going to happen. As soon as the ratings go down, it goes away. And so my, my experiences at 60 Minutes um, really in, it began in 1980. And I, was, um, I, I had graduated Cornell, and it was right after Watergate, and everybody wanted to be a reporter. And so they, they I, I was the Ivy League Writer of the Year and won a few awards, couldn't even get an interview. Um, so I bounced around from newspaper to job to newspaper job, finally landed in a uh, job in uh, WOR-TV. I don't know if anyone remembers WOR-TV. It was no, in New York, it was where the Million Dollar Movie was and Joe Franklin show. And they actually had a news division, which compo was composed of me and two other people. And that was our news division. But I had done a story on, um, on how easy it was to get a hold of military secrets. And uh, that night, the projectionist at 60 Minutes, back then we used to do film. So the projectionist on 60 Minutes normally never watched TV. So that night, he decided to watch TV. And he saw my story. And he was on the coffee line the next day with Don Hewitt. And he said, you know, Don, I saw this stu something last night. It was just like the stuff we used to do. And he said, what do you mean used to do? And I'm not going to spoil the book for you, which I hope you would buy, but I'm just going to read you a few graphs of what happened next. My path to 60 Minutes began on June 1980 when the phone rang at my parents' home in Fresh Meadows, Queens. Is this the home of Ira Rosen, the caller inquired. Yes, who are you? I'm Don Hewitt, executive producer of 60 Minutes. Oh, yes, I've read about you, my mother replied. You have a lovely wife. <laughs> Thank you. What are you doing? I'm making a kugel, my mother said. A kugel? God, I haven't had a good kugel in a long time, Hewitt said. You come visit me, I'll give you a kugel, my mother offered. My mother, Ethel, was the quintessential Jewish mother, nagging, judgmental, someone with all the answers. Actually, I'm looking for Ira, Hewitt said. I'd like to see if he'd be interested in being a producer for 60 Minutes. Oh, he's not interested. He's got a good job, my mother said. Thanks anyway. I listened from across the room to the conversation, and I asked my mother who was on the phone. Don Hewitt of 60 Minutes. He wanted to offer you a job, but I told him you already had one, she said. How many jobs do you need? I leapt from the chair and raced to the phone to call Hewitt back. Even though a few minutes had passed, he immediately picked up the phone. He was laughing. I don't know about you, but I like your mother. If you don't want the job, tell her it's hers. <laughs> so needless to say, I kind of wanted the job. So I went in, and I was 26 years old at the time. And, um, at the, and, I, and they said, I didn't know what, what I was even being interviewed for. And I had learned the art of storytelling from working in the Catskills. And I used to be a tennis pro at the Homawack Lodge. I don't know if anyone knows these hotels. The Windsor, the Nemerson. I was a waiter, lifeguard, you know, whatever, schlep. Um, I also, but I worked, as part of the job, you had to work the night lights. And I used to work the night lights for Jan Murray and Alan King and Red Buttons, still in mirrors to this, you know, still have nightmares of still in mirror, you know, yelling at me because who do you, how do you, who do you focus on, still or a mirror? And, and um, 
But I learned the art of telling a joke. Henny Youngman, for example, told the great joke about, take my wife, pause, please, or I'm going to take my wife to a place she's never been before, the kitchen. Now, <laughs> that is told all in a sentence. It has a beginning, middle, and end. It has a subject, a motivation, all told in a few words. That's the secret of a good story. I said this to Hewitt, and he jumped up, and he said, that's how I learned to tell stories. I worked in the Catskills, too. So I had Don sold. But he said, it doesn't really matter if I like you. He has to like you. And the he he was talking about was Mike Wallace. Now, Mike Wallace at that time was the number one correspondent on the number one show in the country and a guy who took no prisoners. And with Don, we were joking and laughing. And I was telling him how to hang his pictures. Mike wanted none of that. He looked at my resume, which had sort of kind of a very checkered career in newspapers in terms of Fresno Bee and the Long Beach Independent. And he said, you don't have much experience to be a 60 Minutes producer here. And he said, I, a question that I still remember and I've used myself, he said, I know what I could do for you. What could you do for me? And it was a great question. And I didn't have a good answer. But I noticed he had a tennis ball in the corner. And it had been given to him by Art Buckwald. And Buckwald wrote an inscription saying, a great tennis career cut short by this ball that was left on the court by Mike Wallace, because he tripped and broke his ankle. And I said, you play tennis. And he said, what's it to you? And I said, well, I used to be on the Cornell tennis team. And Mike later said that, he said, right then and there, he figured he'll hire me for six months. And if I don't work out, at least he'll get some good tennis out of me. So Don walks in and he said, so Mike, what do you think? Give the kid a chance. By the way, at 60 Minutes, they never call you by your name. It's never, I don't think I've ever been called Ira. It's always kid or young America. So Mike kind of shrugged. Don comes back a few minutes later and offers me a contract. And I kind of walk out dazed because I had been in Fresno and all these caca places. And suddenly, I'm now becoming at the age of 26. Mike Wallace's producer on 60 Minutes. And here's what happened. I walked out of the office days. I'd come from covering high school sports in Fresno to becoming Mike Wallace's producer on the hottest show on TV. Not only was Mike the star, but I'd become the youngest producer they ever hired. I called my mother to tell her, Mom, I was just hired to be Mike Wallace's producer on 60 Minutes. Without missing a beat, my mom said, Mike Wallace? He's so old. Why can't you work for Dan Rather? <laughs> Jewish mother. <laughs> and so I started my career with Mike, and it was an extraordinary, extraordinary adventure. And you know, one of the stories um, I had done was on, uh, we, which we had talked a little bit about, was Joe Bonanno, the head of organized crime, the Bonanno crime family. And it was the only interview we ever did. Most of the best stuff in an interview is really spoken about after the crew leaves and Wallace leaves. And, and Bonanno and I are having a cognac in the backyard. And I say to him, you know, hey, Joe, um, Maya Lansky was the guy. Maya Lansky and Sandy Koufax were the two people I admired like as a kid growing up. What was the secret of Lansky? Was he that good with numbers? And he looked at me and he said, numbers? He had the picture. And I said, the picture? What picture? He said, the picture of J. Edgar Hoover and his deputy, Clyde Tolson, having sex. And we used that picture to blackmail the FBI to not go after us. And you know, for people who know this, J. Edgar Hoover denied that it, it was ever such a thing as organized crime, you know, years, years, even after Appalachia. Uh, and then I said to him, who killed Kennedy? And he said, well, when, when it was done, he called, he said, I called down to Santos Traficante, who is the head of organized crime in Miami, and I asked him what's going on, and Traficante said, don't worry about it. New York's not going to take any heat for it. It's only going to be Miami and New Orleans, which was Carlos Marcello. And Joe was curious, so he sent his consigliere to Miami to talk to Traficante, and Traficante said, we tried to kill Kennedy in, in Miami, but we took care of him in Dallas. Now, here's the thing. As a journalist, I'm going to give you a lesson, which is you don't run and print this thing. You sort of take it in because you have an understanding that in these social clubs that the organized have, they all 
tell stories. Everyone loves to tell a story. You know, hey, Kim, come here. Let me tell you how Kennedy was killed. You don't know if it's true, if it's not true, if it's Bubba Misa. And that's as, but unfortunately today, the story I just told you would be the lead item on whatever network had it and stuff. And, and I was an extraordinarily careful journalist. And I, I always felt that the best stories I did were stories that I never put on the air. And there was a story, for example, um, I, I was running um, 60 Minutes office in Washington uh, with Mike. And one day, uh, I come to my office, and there's a brown envelope on the uh, table. And I open it up, and it was the Majestic 12 document, which was the secret document about UFOs that crashed in the US. And it, and it was a beautiful document. And it had listed all the people who had knowledge of this in the Eisenhower administration. And it was, it was magnificent. And it wasn't like there was, there was no internet then. So I read the document, put it down, read it again, and then put it back in the, in the envelope and just sat there and thought. So I went to the Library of Congress, began to cross-check the names that are listed on the documents, the typeface from the period of time when the document was printed. Again, we had no internet. You have to do it the hard way. Uh, and I determined it was a fake. And I, I put it away, and, and uh, a couple weeks went by, and my next door neighbor at work was the BBC. And I mentioned this to my friend at lunch. And he said, I'd love to do a feature story about it. So I said, all right, sure. So I gave it to him like a fool. He, of course, then splashed it around the planet. UFOs are real, Majestic 12 documents. So Don Hewitt and Mike Wallace called me and said, hey, kid, you got to get on this story. It's a big story. I said, and then I told them what happened. They said, are you sure it was fake? And I said, I went through my reporting with them. And they said, OK. And sure enough, in one of the only times I've ever seen this, the FBI labeled the document as, as fake. They, li they literally put the word bogus, which I've never seen on any document by a federal government before. Um, but those, that kind of reporting, again, I'm not singing my own praises here, but it doesn't exist in many ways today. There's bias, there's run and print, um, there's, um, you know, you have to have a, a point of view that, you know, is one way or the other. Um, I had done some collaborations with the Washington Post, and they had a fantastic editor there named Marty Barron. And Marty was, um, you know, was really probably one of the great journalists in, in the country. But Marty, after he left and he retired, and he's, he's, I think, writing his own memoir. He may be speaking here next year. But Marty, but Marty said that um, you know, one of the reasons that caused him great disturbance a great deal is that reporters came in with their bias. They came in saying, this is, person is guilty, or that person is guilty. And, and I, I don't know where this comes from. This is not the background that I had. Um, I connected with people. I would literally go from a phone calls from, with, from Al Sharpton to Steve Bannon, from Al Gore to Jim Coburn, who's a conservative, who's a conservative senator from, from Oklahoma. And I thought nothing about it. I didn't think about their points of view. I was just con conversations with them. And I was open-minded about it, which is what I described at the beginning about a good 60-minute story. Have an open mind when you see it. Um, and unfortunately, even the 60 minutes of today, even though they do some very, very good work and my friends are on the program, um, I, I'm disappointed in what I see. Um, they begin a season with an interview with the president, followed by the next week by an interview with the Secretary of State. Then they go to Ukraine, and I'm getting excited. Oh boy, this is going to be a really good story. And they interview the First Lady of Ukraine. And it's like face the nation. There's nothing unique or special when we work there with Don and Mike. And Mike, let me tell you about working with Mike Wallace. And, and it was um, that trade, that choice. Choices are what life is about and the choices you make. And Mike was brutal. Mike really, um, you know, he, he beat up everybody. He beat up his producers. He beat up his family. Chris Wallace, who I would later work with, would talk about this. 
Um, and we had the producers who work with Mike, we had our own little mash unit. There was one producer uh, who named his ulcers Myron, which is his real name. Another producer had lost all his hair at the age of 30. Another one had perennial bad backs. You walk by the hallways 60 minutes, people are lying on the floor because their backs are all out. And I can't, even in my, and when, on my honeymoon, I was laying on the floor because my back was bad. And, and it was caused by Mike. Mike would um, walk in. He was sort of like, he, he hated to be bored. And he'd walk in and he'd say, who are you on the phone with? And, and you know, you'd have to go through it. This is why you're having a phone conversation. So one day he did this and I gave him the phone. I walked out the door and of course it was my mother. <laughs> and he never did that again. Um, he was, um, he, he, he said later in life on upon reflection of, of his behavior, and, and I write in the book, and I'm not going to go through all of it, but he, he, was, he was horrible to women. Um, and there, there are some very vivid and horrible examples of his behavior. Um, but he reflected later on, and he said, you know, maybe I wasn't so nice, but the stuff I turned out was first rate. But I don't think his producers nor I would forgive him for the way he behaved towards us and the abuse we took. And what was sad about the ending for Mike, and, and I had worked with Mike, and, um, in, and I, I'm not going to get into all the stories, but our, we had a final big breakup where I ended up leaving to be senior producer of Primetime Live. Um, and then, um, and I, ironically, I was Chris Wallace's boss. So imagine the thinking about the Wallace family. I suffered the abuse under Mike, and now I'm boss of Chris Wallace. And to Chris's credit, by the way, he never once asked before he did a story or an interview, what would my father do? He always wanted to carve his own path in his own way. But um, after spending 15 years at ABC, I returned to 60 Minutes. I wasn't working with Wallace. I'd end up working with two fantastic people, uh, Bill Whitaker and Leslie Stahl, who I adore. And she said, oh, that's right, she is. She absolutely is. And she's amazing. And what a, what a great journalist. And, and we had a really amazing time. But the Wallace that I had left behind had changed. He was a different person. Some of it was age, some of it was he had a heart procedure and he was under anesthesia for too long and it triggered something in his brain that was not good um, and I, he began to have memory loss. And, um, and he also had incredible mood swings. And one of the things about Wallace, probably his greatest accomplishment of all the stories that he did in the course of his life, probably the thing that he was probably accomplished the most when he blew the whistle on his own depression. And doctors had told him, Mike, don't, don't go public with your depression. It's going to hurt your career. People are going to think less of you. And, and he listened to that advice or, or whatever it was. Um, and he, he didn't say anything. And then finally, um, I was on the road with him. And um, we were in... Um, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, on our way to Lewisburg Federal Prison to interview a couple of the inmates. And he started to punch the window and his hand was all bloodied. And, and he said, keep driving, keep driving. And I'm like, oh my God. And then we do the interview and of course, it's the Mike Wallace of old and he does fantastic interviews. And on the way back from Lewisburg to Harrisburg to fly back to New York, he says, pull over and he, he, we pull over and he throws up. And he said, don't tell anyone in the office about any of this. So I said, OK. And then we do another shoot um, a few days later on another story. And um, it, it's on the air very quickly. I turned it around pretty quick. And he calls me up that Sunday night after it aired. And he said, kid, I saw the story. I watched the story. I obviously was there. I don't have any memory of doing this story. And he checked in the next day to the hospital. And that's when he went public with his depression. And so now I'm, I'm to, now it's, I'm back for my second tour of duty and, and Mike 
um, is still, he's, he's, he's much better, he's, he's receiving his, his medicine, uh, he's doing well, except he still has the tendencies to blow up at the help. But unfortunately, the help is also the executive producer. And there was a new executive producer at 60 Minutes. And um, they're screening a story. Mike thought it was two parts. The executive producer said one part. And Mike said, F you. And Jeff Fager said, you're finished. And he gets up and he walks out the door. And Jeff goes back to his office, calls the president of CBS News, Sean McManus, and says, I just fired Mike Wallace. And Sean says, I totally support you. And Mike, of course, doesn't know what he's talking about, because that's the way he had talked all his life to people, including Don Hewitt, who had run the show previously. And he goes back, and Jeff says, go to Sean. He'll talk to you. I'm not talking to you. And Sean says, you're finished at 60 minutes. Let's figure out a graceful exit. Um, and Mike didn't know what hit him. And you know, they ended up. Um, uh, uh, Mike's agent um, was negotiating, trying to get Mike back on the broadcast, and he, had a, he got Mike a speaking gig at ESPN to speak in front of all of ESPN. And he, um, they're driving up to Bristol, Connecticut, and you know, Liebner gives him the contract, and Mike looks at it, he says, okay, puts it in his jacket pocket, he gets up in front of the audience, and he takes out any contract, he says, so I'm getting $15,000 to speak for 20 minutes. My, my, that's pretty good. And he just reads the contract. And that was his speech. After the speech, Liebner calls NBC, which is where he wanted to move Mike to, and calls off the deal. He said, I can't in good conscience bring you Wallace. This is not the Wallace of old. And so he calls CBS, and they negotiated a deal where Mike got a new office all the way in the back, basically in the storage area, an um, office Mike would never step foot in. And during, uh, and, and it was really in many ways one of the saddest things I've ever seen in TV. Here's this legendary figure, this extraordinary man who's now reduced to basically having an office next to where the janitor stores the brooms. And he, um, he, he, he wouldn't show up anymore. You know, he'd show up occasionally, but he wouldn't go to the office. And one of the things he and I joked about, I always used to accuse Mike of dying, coloring, or coloring his hair, and he always denied it. And so one, day, so one day after spending the summer at the vineyard, he comes into my office and he says, kid, I want to show you something. And he wore a hat, and he takes his hat off. His head was basically all gray. And he says, I don't give a shit anymore. And he puts his hat back, walks out. A few months later, he's, um, he, he, um, he leaves 60 minutes. His memory begins to fail. Um, and within about a year or two, he's sent to a nursing home. And I went to visit him. And it was the last time I would see Mike, a Connecticut nursing home. And Chris, I called up Chris to let me know what to expect. And Chris says, he doesn't really remember very much, but there'll be moments in the, in, the, uh, in the conversation where the fog lifts, and it's like the ship seeing the shore for a second or two, and you'll see the Mike Wallace of old. And then it closes up, and then the ship sails in, off into the fog. And sure enough, I go to visit Mike, and I'm telling him about all the various stories that he and I did, you know, from Joe Bonanno, Marlon Brando, and on and on. And he's saying, yep, yep, but he doesn't remember a single one. In fact, he didn't remember having worked on 60 Minutes. He only remembered drop shotting me in tennis and watching me fall on my face to chase the ball. And I, I wondered, what is the point of this whole business that we're in? You know, if at the end of the day, you don't even remember what you've been doing and what you've dedicated your life to for 50 years, and you have no serious memory of it all. And it, it was really a very, very sad kind of moment. And, um, and, and I've, I, I've, I've spoken about the book a little bit. and. Um, and what I found, one of the more interesting questions people have asked me at the end, especially when I tell the stories about, you know, I have a chapter in the book called No Happy Endings, which unfortunately many of the most successful people have not had good exits. 
And, um, and they said, what have you learned from all the people you've met and all the stories you've done and all the experiences? What are, what are the lessons of life that you've learned? And let me tell you what I've learned. And, and, and it's advice that I've given to my children, which is fix what you broke. If it's a relationship, house fixtures, make the planet better than when you came. Leave this place better than when you came. Don't hold grudges. It will dominate your being. Everyone in this room has been slighted by something or somebody or someone. Forget about it. Move on. Don't let it dominate you. And keep your real friends close. Shed the bad relationships. And try to talk to people who matter in your life. As you get older, the circle should close around the people who are most important to you, your family, your good friends, whoever you deem to be most important. That's who you should spend your time with. Anyway, that's it. So anyway, thank you for having me. Um, and I'm, I'd love to hear your questions because I could just yak on forever. So please, if you have any questions, I'd I love to like hear you. Here. Yep. Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I've always wondered about people who have a sense of themselves staying in that kind of position where they're abused. No, good question. Yep. Why would you do that? It, it's a great question. And, and um, I have often asked myself, it's part, I did it because I was ambitious. Um, I was learning the art form the, from the Picasso of journalism. And, and um, yes, I was abused, but I also was 26, 28, 30, and I felt that um, I, I'm, I'm learning, and, and I'm building a career, and um, that, that was the main reason. And um, did, did I sacrifice things as a result of it? Friendships, relationships I was in at the time? Yes. Um, I was not an easy person to be with during the period of time in the early years I was working with Mike. But I was very gung-ho. Ambition ruled me. Any others? Yes. Well, so, so you, you, those are great questions. The first question, really, in terms of trust, I think um, you have to trust what you trust. You have to read the papers. You have to, you know, you have to read both sides of the story. You know, and everyone, friends of mine at the New York Times tell me that uh, they can't print any negative stories about Biden because they're worried, the editors there are worried that they're going to reelect Trump. And it's like, what? So, you know, you need to read both sides of a story. Um, there is so much bias at this point in time in journalism. This is why I spoke the way I did for as long as I did about it. Um, and I think you need to make the, your own decision about what you believe and what you trust by gaining and gathering information. Uh, and that's the way you do it. And the second question you had was, um, Sure. I think what they've done, 60 Minutes has been in, I mean, one of the things I talk about in, in the book is, you know, when, when I began, there was no internet. So we used to do something called airport roulette, where you go to an airport, you say, next flight out. And you, if the next flight takes you to, you know, Kansas, and the flight after is Vegas, sorry, you're going to Kansas. You get to Kansas, you gather all the newspapers. If there's a good story, you work the story. If it's not, you get back to the airport counter, you throw your card down, you say, next flight out. And after three or four days, you would gather and find a story. But that's pretty expensive to do. Today, 60 Minutes, I think, is very, very budget conscious. They try to do stories that could be turned around in a day or two. Um, it's try to imagine if you told your builder, I need this house built in three days. You got three days. I'll give you a bonus if you could do it in three. 
no, you want to take your time. You're going to live in this house. You're going to be there. And I think things today are really ruled by the dollar. I think the heart of 60 Minutes is still there. Leslie Stoll is still fantastic. Whitaker is great. Um, Anderson Cooper is really strong. But you, you, they're limited by, by the choices and the amount of time that they had. And the last story I did before retiring from the show was the one you know that you know probably the most award-winning piece in the history of the broadcast, which is about the opiate epidemic, and I did it collaboratively with the Washington Post. It was basically how Congress neutered the powers of the DEA at the height of the opiate epidemic, and sided with the drug companies and allowed the 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 thing to spread, opiate epidemic to spread, and um, you know we we had months to do it, and and when when we were doing it just. To show you the point of fairness, um, I sat down with the, um, the, all the lawyers for the drug companies and spent an entire Sunday going through the reporting of the story, gave them a chance to answer things, to show me any documents. Story changed. I think it became better, even though we took things out of it. We sharpened things up. Um, you don't see that much anymore. Now it's like, here, we're running the story tomorrow. Give us a comment. And they, a lot of times the reporter just wants you to deny it. Just give me your denial or something. That's, it's lousy journalism. Anyway, yes? Well, I'm not doing that much tour. Um, I, I, um, I've been working since I was 15 years old. And uh, I retired and, and was celebrated at 66 when I retired. And Bill Whitaker and Leslie Stoll threw a, a party for me, invited everybody. Um, and that was great. And I, I probably am getting an offer a week to do things. Somebody is, is you know, I'm going to meet with him Monday or Tuesday. He wants to create a network and he wants me to run it. Um, you know, I mean, the, but I, I'm not trying to jump into something. Um, there's, you know, my, one of my closest friends is Barry Sheck, who created the Innocence Project. And Barry and I have talked about doing a certain type of documentary, uh, because I think there's nothing worse than a person being uh, put in jail for 20 and 30 years for a crime that they didn't commit, uh, and being railroaded by cops or, or prosecutors. So Barry and I are probably going to do something together. Probably that's going to be the next thing I embrace. Yes? Sure, great question. In, great question, which is, what does a producer do? And, and um, I don't know, did any, has anybody seen, if they, you haven't, you should, it's on Paramount, it's, it's called The Offer, and it's about the creation of The Godfather. And there's, there's a scene where um, Ruddy, who's the star of the show, who's the producer of The Godfather, is, is you know, brings a date along to, to to shoot one day, and she says, what does a producer do? And then watches what happens in the course of the day, and I, 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 I hope everybody could get a chance to see it. A producer is a person who finds the story, researches the story, writes the questions, um, gets the people to sit down, do the story, then ultimately, if it's a good story, gives the full credit to the correspondent, and if it's a bad story, takes the full blame. Um, and so basically, you, you have to fix things that are broken. Anybody could be a producer in this room. If a person shows up on time, they're in a good mood, they're, they're talkative, they're interesting, uh, the correspondent is, is, is vibrant and awake and, and asking great questions, that never happens. What usually happens is the person shows up with their lawyer, lawyer is interrupting the person from talking, the correspondent is pissed off, not Leslie Stoll, Bill Whitaker, but say Mike Wallace, is pissed off that they actually have to work that day, uh, is pissed at the questions that you wrote, then begins to badger the person, and they're getting into an argument. Meanwhile, you have two camera crews, and you're paying a lot of money, and this shoot is going down the tubes, and you, as the producer, have to fix the moment. You have to save it. And that's what I did. Yes? I just have a comment. Um, a friend of mine was a, a TV 
charge of the registry of motor vehicles about 20 years ago. Uh, and I, I just to comment the fact that when you first started your speech, uh, the most difficult issue for him was to deal with the issue of elderly people, an elderly person losing their license. Exactly. He said it was the most difficult. But what made that story so good is that I could, I could do a poll right now in the room and ask, how many people think a should, person should lose their license? And then I, how many people think the person you know, should keep their license? And you'd probably, I would imagine it would probably be pretty split. Um, and, and that's what made the great story, the choices, the moral dilemma. I began with the story about my dad in Poland and the choices people in the town made to save a Jew or kill a Jew, what choice would you do, knowing you, 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 you know the consequences? It's, you don't see that much on TV anymore. Um, I, I don't know how we are on time, but I think one more question, one more question if there is anybody. Go, yes. Um, do you think CNN is serious about putting Wallace up against 60 Minutes? Do they, I mean, do they really think that he's going to take viewers away? Uh, I, I thought he's doing a morning show. He's doing a Sunday morning show. He's doing a Sunday night show. Oh, is he? Okay, I haven't. I haven't. I, he kept changing. He was originally going to do a morning show. Yeah, it, no, it's not going to. It's not going to impact 60 Minutes at all. Um, they. What happened was they gave Chris a very, very lucrative contract because when he signed up for CNN Plus, which they ended up doing away with. And so they're stuck with his contract, so they need to sort of amortize it in whatever way they can. So I don't think he's going he's to draw flies. Anyway, listen, thank you so much. I'll be signing some books if anyone is interested in reading it. Thank you for having me. Hello there. Just wanted to thank you. On behalf of the JCC and Jewish Book Month, our speaker series, my co-chair Patty McSweeney and myself, Sylvia Belkin, staff Sarah Ewing and Stephanie Greenfield, thank you, Ira Rosen, for giving us this very special opportunity to hear you reflect on your professional career and your insightful revelations regarding um, the writing of your book ticking clock behind the scenes of 60 Minutes. The Jewish Book Month speaker series at the North Shore Jewish Community Center has been in existence for 28 plus years when Carol Schutzer and I talked about creating a platform for authors, inviting authors to come to the J and share their creative ambition firsthand. The program has been a marvelous addition to our community offerings here in Marblehead. Thank you to all of you who have worked so hard and with so much dedication over the years to make such a successful series of events. You may purchase a copy of Ticking Clock behind the scenes at 60 Minutes here tonight, and Ira will be pleased to autograph your copy. <clears throat> Enjoy the refreshments. They're delicious. And join us here at our home uh, or at home on Wednesday, October 19th, for a virtual presentation of Letty Cotton Programman in her revelations about the writing of her latest book, Shanda, a memoir of shame and secrecy. Six presentations follow on October 27th, November 2nd, November 10th, November 13th, November 16th, and November 29th. Thank you for sharing this delightful evening with us. Thank you.